Hey class, welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion from chapter four in discussing objects that are moving in two and three dimensions, primarily in two dimensions with a few example problems. So where we left off is we introduced our kinematic equations, or really reintroduced them, reminding ourselves that we have now kinematic equations in the x direction as well as in the y direction. And if we had three dimensions, we'd also have equations of motion in the z direction. We're going to focus for now primarily on just the two dimensions, x and y. Um, those of you who are engineers and will continue into statics and dynamics, you'll get to deal with three dimensions a whole lot more. So get excited for that. So if we think about projectile motion, I just kind of want to add to where we left off last time. Projectile motion is kind of the term we give to something that while it may have an initial velocity, the only acceleration it experiences is a result of the acceleration due to gravity. And we know acceleration due to gravity is straight down with a magnitude of negative not, or excuse me, a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared, negative because it's down, then its only acceleration will be in the downward direction. And if we're ignoring air resistance, its acceleration in the x direction will be zero. Later in the semester, we'll add in uh, acceleration due to air resistance. But for now, let's assume that it's basically equal to zero or small enough that we can ignore it. And what that means then is an object that's moving in projectile motion, so it's thrown or launched or somehow begins with some initial velocity or spit, um, as someone in the peanut gallery just mentioned, it will move with that initial velocity, maybe at some angle as we see here, and its y component of its velocity will decrease on the way up, reach zero at its maximum height, and then increase but in the negative direction as it falls back down and as we see here the x velocity during that entire time remains constant so the overall velocity yes is indeed changing but its x component is staying constant and its y component is acting the exact same as if it were thrown straight up to the same exact maximum height before returning back down to the ground level so it's really quite amazing that we can deal with this or think about this as being an x direction of motion with zero acceleration and a y motion that says if it's straight up and coming back down with only the acceleration due to gravity. All right, and then putting those two together, we get this nice parabolic shape of projectile motion. All right, so that's what we're going to be working on and working with a little bit as we go forward when dealing with projectile motion um, and things only accelerating as a result of gravity. But keep in mind, again, we're talking about ignoring air resistance for now. We'll add in the force of air resistance later um, in chapter five, we'll talk about it a little bit. So for now, we're gonna ignore it, but say that somebody hits a baseball with some initial velocity, all right? A baseball, because of its high initial speed, something like 50 meters per second, they will be experiencing air resistance. So if we ignore air resistance, you might get a much higher range calculated than what it will actually be able to go as a result of air resistance, all right? So keep in mind, for now we're gonna ignore it just to make things simple. Later on, you'll be adding it in and being able to account for it. But it makes our equations of motion no longer valid because again, remember, all of our equations of motion assume that the acceleration is constant. With air resistance, acceleration actually changes. The rate of acceleration changes. So, fun side note. All right, let's do some example problems. Here's the first one. I'm guessing some of you have gone paintballing. I know at least one of you mentioned that you're a very uh, big fan of airsoft guns. So, anyway, imagine you went paintballing. You have a paintball gun and you're going to shoot it perfectly horizontally. All right, this is the closest I could find in the picture here. So you're going to shoot it perfectly horizontally and assume that the paintball exits the gun at an initial speed of 75 meters per second because you're holding that gun up at about eye level. Let's say that its height above the ground when it exits the gun is 1.5 meters. So I have two questions for you. One is how long is the paintball in the air? Time. All right, and then how far away from you does it land? I could have just asked you part B, how far away does it land from you? And to figure that out, you must figure out the amount of time it's in the air. So pause the video, give this one a go, and then we're gonna step through it together, all right? Did you pause? Hopefully, all right, so 
Let's step through this together. First thing, always, as we go about doing our problem solving process is we need to start with a picture. It doesn't need to be pretty, but you need some sort of picture to really conceptualize and visualize what's going on. So here's my picture, all right? I have my paintball that's starting with a completely X direction velocity of 75 meters per second. What's its initial velocity in the Y? It's zero, all right? So its Y motion will be the same, whoop, boy, howdy, will be the same as if you just were to drop it straight down, but it's also moving in the X direction. Its initial height is one and a half meters, its initial x position is zero, and its final y position is zero because it hits the ground. Its final x, we don't know. So if we want to go about tackling this problem, first thing you're going to need to do is choose. Do you want to start in the x direction or the y direction? X. So my wife says the x direction, which seems like a grand idea, but you'd find quickly with the acceleration being equal to zero, you would need the time to be able to solve for anything. So first we need to find the time. And so to do that, I'm gonna start with the y direction. But my wife makes an excellent point. You could try to start with the x, you could write out all of your variables, write out your equations, and you might get stuck because you don't know the time. That's fine. Leave your work, move on to the y direction, and then you'll likely be able to plug something you learned from the y direction back into the x direction, namely time and be able to solve that way. So if you did that, totally fine, no problem. Just like my wife. I was talking about totally fine. <laughs> anyway, so, um, all right, so oh, moving on. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, moving on to the y direction. So here's our list of our different y variables, right? All six of them are listed here. Our initial y height we know is one and a half meters. We know it ends at the ground, which is zero meters. Our acceleration is gravity in the downward direction, or negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Our final velocity, how fast in the y direction is it moving the moment it hits the ground? I don't know, and I don't care, so I'm just gonna leave that blank. But I do know that my initial speed in the y direction is zero meters per second, and the time also we don't know when we're trying to solve. All right, and again, there's our picture showing us what's going on. So now we wanna try to solve for time. So we're gonna need to pick an equation of motion, boom. I pick this one because if we look, I know every single variable in this equation other than time. All right, so I'm gonna do some plugging in. I know that my initial velocity is zero and my final position is zero. So my equation becomes simpler. I can simplify it moving my y initial to the other side. So I have negative y initial equals one half a t squared. And so to solve for t, it's just gonna be equal to the square root. This is just doing some algebra the square root of two times negative y initial over my acceleration. Some of you might see this and be like, uh-oh, negative under square root, bad news. But our acceleration, as we look up here, we see it's also negative, and so those negatives will cancel out. Plug and chug using our values, and we should find that the time it takes to reach the ground is just over half a second, 0.553 seconds, which is indeed, boom, box worthy, as my sweet pen here says. So. We now have the time, 0.553 seconds is the amount of time it takes to reach the ground. And now we've solved part A and we can move on to part B. So to solve for part B, what direction should we now consider? Amy? <laughs> the X direction, okay, good. Well, she got embarrassed apparently on that one. So the X direction is what we're gonna need to solve part B because we're asked to solve for the X distance, how far away from us it lands. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my, or set up identifying my x variables. So x initial, we know it starts at zero meters. X acceleration, since we're ignoring air resistance, is zero. Final x position, we don't know and we wanna find. X velocity final is the same as x velocity initial since the acceleration is zero. So those are both 75 meters per second. This one you might have left blank and that's totally fine because we don't end up needing it and the time we've now discovered as well. So to solve, we're gonna use the same first equation of motion. We're gonna plug in our variables. We want x final, x initial is zero, v initial is 75, our time is 0.533 seconds, and plus one half, oh, I just found, I think there's a typo. Let's go back real quick, 0.553. So this down here should say 0.553, not 0.533. So I apologize for that typo but I believe my calculation, I just used the number from my calculator, so that should have still 
been accurate. So I apologize for that slight typo. That should be 0.553. But you plug and chug, and you should find that it lands 41 and a half meters away, which once again is box worthy. So good. We figured it out. It looks like since it landed all the way down to the ground, that means you missed your target. So apparently you're bad aim, but you know how far away from you it landed. 41 and a half meters. Sound good? Cool. So before we move on to the second example problem I wanted to do, I had a quick conceptual question for you. It's always kind of a fun one to think about. So let's consider now the moment for a moment. We're going to ignore air resistance. Imagine you have a pellet gun. All right. So you have a pellet gun and you're driving in a convertible. Okay. Say you're driving at 50 miles an hour. Why not? You take that pellet gun, you aim it perfectly vertically straight up and you pull the trigger. Assume the car is moving at a constant 50 miles an hour and assume that there's no air resistance. Where would the pellet land? And I don't need an exact answer. I'm just looking for one of three options. It's probably going to land either in front of you, behind you, or back on top of your gun or back in the car or something, right? So which of those is the right answer? Where will it land? In front of you, behind you, or right back in the car? You could pause it if you want to think about it longer, but I'll go ahead and tell you. Amy, any guesses? I don't know. I'm not participating anymore. Oh, okay. So Amy's not participating anymore. So I'll just tell you. It will land, contrary to popular belief, right back in the barrel of the gun. Because the moment you launched it, while you launched it straight up, the velocity relative to the gun is only vertical. It has the same forward velocity as the vehicle itself. It's moving forward at the same 50 miles an hour that the car is. And so therefore, if we're ignoring air resistance, as the car moves forward, the pellet continues to move forward, landing back in the car if we ignore air resistance. The same thing is true. This seems crazy. A lot of people are like, no, wait a second, you know, because they're so used to living in a world with air resistance. But try it on an airplane. All right. You're no, moving. don't try it on an airplane. Okay, don't, okay, okay, okay. Don't try the pellet gun on the airplane. Try dropping your free little peanut that you get or tossing your peanut up. You're moving at 300 miles an hour or more up there, right? And if you toss that peanut up, it doesn't go flying back to the back of the airplane just because it left your hand all of a sudden. No, it's moving forward with you. And so it's going to land right back in your hand if you toss it straight up, even though it's covered a large distance in that short period of time relative to the ground. So a confusing and tricky example uh, or conceptual question, but a fun one to think about. All right, so I got one more example prompt for you. This is one I wrote a couple years ago when I was super pumped about the Broncos making it to the Super Bowl. So, and they won eventually on the second go. But anyway, so the Broncos, let's say that they're in the Super Bowl again. At the time, their kicker was uh, Brandon McManus. So let's say he kicks a field goal. He kicks the ball, it leaves his foot at a 40 degree angle relative to the ground and it leaves his foot with an initial speed of 22 meters per second, kicks a game-winning field goal, the crowd goes wild, and the Broncos win. Yeah, go Broncos. All right, so if we ignore air resistance, I want you all to determine for me the maximum height that the ball achieves, what is its hang time, the total amount of time it's in the air before reaching the ground, and what is the range, the distance in the X direction covered by the kick. So pause it, giddy up, try it out. All right. Hopefully you paused and, and solved. I'm gonna go ahead and go through this one with you guys here rather quickly. So the first thing that you need to figure out when determining this problem or figuring out this problem is you need to take that initial velocity, the 22 meters per second at a 40 degree angle and you need to break it into X and Y components because it has both an X and a Y component. A lot of people are tempted just to use the 22 meters per second as the initial velocity in both the x and the y equation. That's not true. That 22 meters per second is not just in the x direction or the y direction, but rather has components in both the x and the y direction, components that are less than the 22 meters per second, but vector components that add up to your overall magnitude at the 40 degree angle. So let's start with that. Let's break this into its x and y components. So if this is our initial velocity, Here's our x and our y component. We just did this back in chapter three, right? So let's go ahead and break it down. The x component is just gonna be the overall magnitude times the cosine of the angle. So 22 times the cosine of 40 
our x component is 17 meters per second, and the y component is 22 times the sine of 40, since it's the vertical component, the side opposite of our angle, and it's 14 meters per second. So once we've done that, now we can go about trying to solve. If we want to start by finding the maximum height, that's the first thing we are asked to determine, we should start with the y direction. So in the y direction, our initial position is zero when we're on the ground. Now to find the max height, I'm only looking at half of its path, right? So I want to find its height at this point after only half of its overall time has transpired and after it's only covered half of its range. So that's where it's at its maximum height. But as we talked about earlier, when at maximum height, we know that the velocity in the y direction is zero. Now, does that mean it's not moving? It's stopped altogether? No, it still has its same x velocity. It's only the y velocity that has now changed. All right, our acceleration in the y direction is gravity, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Notice how here I put negative 9.80 meters per second squared. That's because I wanted to just be clear to you, gravity is negative 9.8056 meters per second squared. And so you'll see people round it to negative 9.81, and sometimes people just drop that off and do negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Both will give you within the factors of error that I'm looking for. So you can use either negative 9.8 meters per second squared or negative 9.81. So I did one example with each for your benefit. So our V initial is in the Y direction is the 14 meters per second and at the maximum height, its final velocity is zero. So we want to figure out what is that height. So we can go ahead and use one of our equations of motion, the one that involves height but doesn't have time in it since we don't know the time it takes to get to that max height. So from there, it just becomes algebra. We can solve this for that height. It's going to be equal to the final velocity squared minus the initial velocity squared all over 2 times the acceleration. If we plug in our values, final velocity was 0. 0 squared is still 0. So we have negative 14 meters per second, that quantity squared, over 2 times gravity. Keep in mind, this negative sign right here is outside of the square. Don't square that and give me a negative height. He's not kicking it into the ground. He's making the field goal. Broncos win. Okay, so make sure you know, know that this negative sign is outside of the squared and it stays to cancel out with the negative on bottom. So if you solve, boom, get a box worthy 10 meters high. So it flies to a height of about 33 feet off the ground or 10 meters high. So that's part A. Part B asks us to find the hang time. So to find the overall hang time, I'm also going to use the y direction. Now notice here for the y direction, I want the entire time. So I want the time it takes to get back to the ground. So in that case, both the initial and final position are zero since I'm starting from the ground and landing back at the ground. We know our initial velocity. We know acceleration. I'm going to leave final velocity blank, but as we talked about in back in chapter two, you should be able to figure out because of symmetry that it's just negative 14 meters per second. So anyway, from here, using our y variables, once again, we can choose an equation of motion to solve for time. If we choose this first equation of motion here, or excuse me, the second equation of motion in our list, if we set, uh, use this one, we know all of the variables except for time. So we should be able to solve for time. But if you notice, you get a t squared function, a polynomial. That means that there's two possible solutions. And so what we can do is we can factor out a t and either t equals zero or t equals something else. So I factor out the t and I find, again using algebra, that either t equals zero from our first option when we factored out the t or from this equation here we get t equals 2.9 seconds. So the question is what is the answer? Well both of these are accurate. Both of these are times at which we're at a location of zero, but the first is when we start and the second is when it gets back to the ground. So the correct answer of the overall hang time is 2.9 seconds, which is again, box worthy, boom. So lastly, we're asked to find the range. Some of you may know the range equation, but if you don't, you can still use our equations of motion. So we use our x equation now, we wanna find our x distance. Our x initial is zero, acceleration in the x is also zero.
Our final velocity in the X, you could just put 17 meters per second or you could leave it blank. It actually doesn't matter in this case. And we know that our X initial is 17 meters per second and our time is 2.9 seconds. So just like with the uh, last example problem we did with the paintball, we will use our second equation of motion, plugging in our variables, we can see that it will travel a distance of 49 meters. That is quite the kick. Again, since we're ignoring air resistance, <laughs> he's uh, booting it pretty far. But, I mean, realistically, people have made 50-yard field goals and so on, which isn't a whole lot. Uh, 49 meters isn't much more, especially when you account for the fact that the um, uprights, the goalposts, are at the end of the end zone, so that's 10 meters further back. So it's actually not an unreasonable distance. But we ignored air resistance, so to really kick a 50-yard field goal, he probably would actually have to kick it at a higher speed than 22 meters per second. Anyway, that allows us to solve this problem. Just so you know, as I mentioned, there are shortcut equations. You can drive these, and in fact, I'll let you play around with that a little bit on the um, lab this week. But there's an equation for the range, which makes sure this range equation, people love using it, and it's a great equation, but you must, must, must make sure you remember, do not forget this, that it assumes you are landing at the same height that you started from. There's no change in height. I guarantee you I'm going to mess with you guys on tests and other places and make you deal with situations where you're landing above where you start or landing below where you start. In both of those situations, you cannot use the range equation. It's no longer valid. So make sure you're aware of that. But this is the range equation. This V initial here is the overall initial velocity at this angle. Okay, and this 2 times the angle, you're taking the sine of 2 times the angle. So if your angle is, say, 30 degrees, you're taking the sine of 60, 2 times 30. Don't get confused about where that 2 goes. Okay, so that's your range equation. And then the trajectory equation is a fun one. It'll tell you the height at any x distance when you launch, again, a v initial at some angle theta. So this is choose some x location at any point away from where you started and that will tell you how high you are at that specific point. So those are the range and trajectory equations. You're welcome to add those to your equation sheet if you'd like to use them, but keep in mind the range equation can only be used when you're starting and ending at the same height, the same altitude. All right, so that wraps up chapter four. I might throw in a few extra example problem videos um, later on, but for now you guys should be good to go to rock and roll through chapter four, looking at motion in two dimensions. Let me know if you have any questions.